I'm Scott Turner. I'm the moderator of uh, the, tonight's webinar. Well, today's webinar, I should say. I say tonight because I'm in a different time zone, uh, six hours away, and it's nighttime for us. And our guest tonight is going to be Roger uh, uh, Pilkey. He is Professor of Environmental Studies at UC Boulder. Um, he works at the intersection of, uh, of policy, science, technology, and also sports, I read from your website. And currently he's on sabbatical in Oslo, Norway, helping them uh, build a, uh, a center for uh, COVID uh, pandemic science and politics and policy. Uh, he's also proprietor of the Honest Broker uh, Substack. Uh, lately, he's been in the news uh, about uh, the hysteria over storms and hurricanes and whatnot. Uh, and uh, one of the things that he is uh, renowned for is uh, asking people who make claims about climate uh, to actually take a look at the data, because the data often say something different from what uh, we are being told. <clears throat> and so uh, uh, Roger will be giving us a presentation uh, tonight, followed by uh, questions and answers. Um, we hope we'll have lots and lots of questions and lots and lots of answers for you. Let me just uh, mention that if you have uh, Q&A Q or questions, uh, uh, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, uh, because uh, among other things, uh, it helps us put things all in one place and also gives you the opportunity to upvote or downvote whatever it is we're uh, talking about. So Roger, welcome to our webinar. And uh, can you tell us a little bit about what yourself and uh, yourself and what you'll be uh, talking about? Yeah, thanks, Scott. Um, I will share my screen and jump right into it. All right. Hello, everybody. Greetings from Oslo, Norway. It's dark and cold. Um, I'm having a great time. Uh, the title of my talk, and I'm going to try to get through this pretty quickly. Um, I do have a lot of information, um, but I'm going to stay on target here. Um, so that we can have a good conversation is climate misinformation. And I'm gonna to explain to you what I mean by that in the talk. Um, so before I dive in, let's uh, start at the outset. Um, climate change is in my view, it's real, it's serious, um, and it deserves urgent attention to both mitigation and adaptation policies. Um, and if you're looking for an early Christmas gift for that special someone, you can get my views in detail in the Climate Fix uh, book I did on climate change um, that I think is held up pretty well, uh, but nothing in this talk should be interpreted any, any differently than, than this uh, opening statement. All right, so my main argument today is that climate science and, and climate journalism, journalism in general with respect to climate, have a misinformation problem. Um, and it's uh, both uh, science and to some extent journalism uh, we expect to be self-correcting over time, and uh, these self-correction mechanisms have not always done particularly well. So my outline is, um, I do have a bit more what I call throat clearing as background. I give you a little introduction to myself and some of my experiences in this field. Um, I'm going to go into three examples. All of them are in my areas of expertise, hurricanes, disasters, and climate scenarios. And then I'll uh, end with some provocations about, well, where do we go from here, um, given that there is um, I think uh, undeniably a uh, misinformation problem out there. All right, so let me just tell you a little story. Um, in 2013, I was invited to testify. Uh, I've testified many times before the House and the Senate. Um, and at the time, uh, some of you may recall, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change had just released a report called the Special Report on Extreme uh, Weather, uh, SREX. And my job at the time, um, as I saw it, was to summarize what that report said for senators, um, as well as the recent uh, U.S. National Climate Assessment. Um, and much to my surprise and initial delight, um, my testimony, which isn't usually anything that goes viral, went viral. Um, as you can see, it had more than 400,000 views on YouTube. Um, and so the views that I were expressing, which were really channeling those of the IPCC, um, got a lot of attention. And that led to a lot of interesting um, repercussions, outcomes. I'll just tell you a few of those. Um, 
John Holdren, who was uh, President Obama's science advisor, uh, posted a six page screed about me on the White House website. Uh, I think I'm the only US academic ever um, attacked by a sitting science advisor. Um, not long after, uh, Representative Raul Grijalva opened an investigation of me, um, claiming that I was taking money under the table from fossil fuel companies, um, which led to um, several years of, of being under investigation. And I think, in my opinion, led to uh, my university deciding to close down two centers, uh, ultimately, that I was affiliated with. Um, in 2016, I was in the WikiLeaks. Um, surprise, surprise. Um, and in the WikiLeaks, it was revealed that there was a campaign to undermine me, funded by Tom Steyer, led by John Podesta at the Center for American Progress. Um, and I have more stories I could tell about Paul Krugman and, and Michael Mann. Uh, but let me just say it's been an interesting um, journey uh, over the last decade or so. Um, and, and I'll admit, it can be unsettling when you find yourself the target of intentional misinformation. Um, if I Google myself, the, the, the person that I see that comes up, um, I don't recognize uh, as myself. Um, so I do have an evil online avatar. Um, and I've come to learn that that goes with the territory. If you do work that has impact, that's broadly read, that's relevant in policy and politics, you know, buckle up. That's how it goes. Um, and ultimately, I found it pretty empowering. Um, I don't have uh, funding. I don't have sponsors. I don't have corporate money. Um, and I don't have titles. I don't have positions. Um, but what I do has, I have a platform and I have a voice. Um, and importantly, I have academic tenure. And I have decided that for the rest of my career, as long as I'm in academia, I'm going to use that tenure. Um, that's a little bit of background. So, Another thing I've done whenever I talk about extreme weather is I introduce people to you know, who I am a little bit through my politics. So I'm going to tell you who my votes for president have been. Um, in seventh grade, I don't know why, um, I was a fan of John Anderson. That's my earliest, uh, 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 I would say, infatuation with the presidential candidate. Um, my first election I voted in, I voted for Jesse Jackson, and then Bill Clinton. Yep, again. And Ralph Nader. And like most people, as I got older, I took a sharp turn to the right after Jackson and Nader. Voted for John Kerry, Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton, and Joe Biden. Um, I am often asked by people, why do I highlight misinformation from the so-called good guys on climate? Those people who may share my political leanings and are trying to support climate action. Why shouldn't I focus on the bad guys? Give the good guys a break. They're trying to do the right thing. So I have two responses to that. One is there has been an incredibly intense focus on climate information put forward opposed to climate action. And almost exclusively, they're on the political right. Um, over the past five years, I just looked this up the other day on Google Scholars, there's 1,760 academic papers that are focused on so-called climate deniers. Um, 1,260 focus on climate skeptics. Um, and I find that the focus on identifying, deplatforming, sanctioning deniers has become a strange and unhealthy obsession amongst those uh, on the political left. And in the upper right of this slide, just last week, a week and a half ago, David Malpass of the um, World Bank um, was accused of saying something that was related to climate denial. And there was a campaign by the New York Times and others to have him either remove from his position or resign. Um, this situation has become so unhealthy that in some areas of science, it's simply, you know, if someone disagrees with you, then you must be a denier. Um, and it's a very unhealthy situation. But the bottom line is, there's no shortage of attention here. The more important fact is scientific integrity matters. Um, I wrote a whole book on this called The Honest Broker. Um, but irrespective of my or your politics, um, we should be able to agree that scientific integrity um, on any topic, whether it's uh, the pandemic, whether it's energy policy, uh, whether it's gender, whether it's climate, um, scientific integrity matters. And that's uh, where my commitment lies. All right, finally, still clearing my throat, and then I'm about done to get into the, the action here. A bit more about me. Um, I wrote the first PhD dissertation, I'm pretty sure in the world on the role of climate science and supporting climate policy. Uh, my first book, uh, with my dad, my dad um, was on hurricanes, 1997. I was a scientist at NCAR, um, National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, uh, 94 to 2001. And I focused on extreme weather, uh, hurricanes and floods in particular. 
Um, my peer reviewed research was cited by all three working groups of the IPCC in the last two years. Um, and I've consistently supported action on climate mitigation and adaptation. All right, that's a bit about me, where I've come from, what I do, what my perspectives are. Let me say, as I get into these examples of misinformation on climate, none of that depends on my politics or my academic record. In fact, I would like to think that the, the cases I'm gonna to present to you here, hurricanes, disasters, and climate scenarios are so clear cut, they're so obvious. Um, that we should be able to agree regardless of where we sit politically. So I'm gonna go through each um, in a little bit of detail and set the stage for, for our conversation. So let's start with hurricanes. Um, and I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna go through a litany of examples of misinformation. I'm gonna give you the, the, the actual science of hurricanes. Um, the, the examples are so prevalent um, so obvious, so common every time there's a hurricane nowadays. Um, I'm not going to waste your or my time um, citing that, but let's go into what the science says. So this is a figure, um, and if you follow me on Twitter or um, on uh, The Honest Broker, um, you've seen versions of this, and I update it every year as new data comes in. But what it shows is uh, continental United States landfalls of Category 1 and stronger storms from 1900 to 2021. And the red uh, line there is just a simple linear least squares uh, regression. Um, it, it looks like it's going down a little, but don't read anything into that. It's, it, what we can say about this is it's not going up. And I have a lot of fun um, on Twitter and with journalists um, at big data journalism outlets and other places, um, because this figure, to my knowledge, has never been produced in the mainstream media. Um, which is shocking to me because the mainstream media loves to do graphs and data. Um, the landfall record in the United States doesn't go up. It's contrary to a lot of claims that are made. Uh, I was then uh, interested to learn that actually it did appear in the mainstream media just a couple of weeks ago. This is Bill Nye, the science guy on CNN. Now he's got my figure. This is it. This is that exact figure. He's holding it. And what he did, someone put uh, a title here that said no increase in hurricane frequency, referring to the landfalls. That's true. That's an objectively true statement. He took a Sharpie, crossed out no, and emphasized increase. Now, if you're familiar with Sharpies and hurricanes and Donald Trump, it's, there's some irony there. Um, but this is about uh, as straightforward misinformation as, as you can find. Um, there's not an increase. And, uh, uh, Bill Nye um, said that this is misleading information, um, which is interesting. So here's my graph, and there you can see it. So it's been in the mainstream media. I don't know if I can make that claim anymore. Um, some people would like to see what the most intense hurricanes are. This is category, uh, category three, four, and five, the most intense storms. Um, and the most notable feature of this record is this period from 2006 to 2017 in which there were no intense hurricanes that made landfall. <clears throat> so for people who have come to climate awareness in the last two decades, um, it does seem like there's a lot more hurricanes than we used to have. Um, but if you were around in the 1915s, 1920, 1945, 1950, um, the recent period is not unusual. This one also looks like it has a slight decline, but the best we can say is over a century time scale, it has not gone up. And indeed, don't take it from me, here's what NOAA says, um, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. After adjusting for a likely undercount of Atlantic hurricanes in the pre-satellite era, there's essentially no long-term trend in hurricane counts. The evidence for an upward trend is even weaker. If we look at US landfalling hurricanes, which show a slight negative trend beginning from 1900 or from the late 1800s. This was updated last week, 3rd of October, 2022. Uh, some people say, well, you can't just look at the Atlantic. It's a small, small basin with a small proportion of storms. And that's true. That's absolutely true. Um, Ryan Maui does a great job of keeping uh, global data updated. So at the top, you see a time series, 12-month running sum of hurricane strength storms. And the bottom curve shows um, the major hurricanes worldwide. And what you see here is there's no upward trend. And in fact, over the last uh, 12 months or so, it's one of the lowest periods for hurricanes or major hurricanes 
uh, of the last 40 years. All right, but what about intensity, frequency? Um, so this is a measure, it's a technical measure, it's called ACE. Um, it was developed by, uh, by uh, Bob Gray at uh, CSU, uh, William Gray at CSU in the 1980s, uh, accumulated cyclone energy, ACE. Um, and it integrates uh, frequency and intensity. And uh, Colorado State University publishes a global data set of this. And I pulled it off the internet yesterday and graphed it um, from 1980 to 2021. So 42 years, put the linear fit there. I mean, that's as flat as a pancake. So again, globally, uh, the most integrated measure um, doesn't show an increase. Uh, but again, don't take it from me, take it from the US national uh, or this, uh, the IPCC, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the, the AR6. U.S. landfalls, no trend in the frequency of U.S. landfall events. Overall Atlantic hurricane activity, there's still no consensus in the re relative magnitude of human and natural influences on past changes in Atlantic hurricane activity. Globally, there's low confidence in most reported long-term multi-decadal to centennial trends in tropical cyclone frequency or intensity-based metrics. Sometimes I think uh, people like to have a go at me because uh, going after the IPCC would just be, uh, <laughs> would be too difficult and too challenging, uh, even though the work I've done, my research and my conclusions are, are hand in glove with those of the IPCC. So is it possible that in the future, climate change may result in more hurricanes or more intense hurricanes or a significant increase in hurricane rainfall? Could it change uh, landfall locations, make them more northerly? more southerly in the southern hemisphere or affect intensification rates? Um, or one day can we detect impacts of sea level rise or damage? And the answer is, of course, these are all possibilities. Um, some have been predicted, um, but we have to be sure that uh, we don't confuse hypotheses with conclusions. Um, if we're seeing things in 2022 that aren't supposed to emerge from the data until 2100 or 2200, um, then we have bigger problems with our, our projections. All right, I'm gonna jump to the second example, disasters. Um, I'm gonna talk uh, briefly about global disasters, then I'm gonna talk about the um, US disaster. All right. So this is, um, this is a statement that's repeated. It's been repeated a number of times by the World Meteorological Organization in the last few years, uh, most recently the last month. The number of weather, climate, and water-related disasters has increased by a factor of five over the past 50 years. And here's the Secretary General of the UN talking about floods, droughts, heat waves, extreme storms, and wildfires going from bad to worse, breaking records with alarming frequency. There's nothing natural about the new scale of these disasters. Um, and let me just say, personally, I, um, in the 90s and early 2000s, I did a lot of work with the WMO uh, which I've always found to be a very strong science-based organization. And it is a little bit sad for me to see them go off into making statements like this, um, as you'll see in the next few slides. So the global disaster database, <coughs> excuse me, is kept by uh, the Center for the Re Center for Research in the Epidemiology of Disasters in Belgium. Um, the data set is called EMDAT. Um, in 2004, they put out a report on the, the disaster data set. And it had this figure in it. And so this covered um, disasters from 1974 to 2004. It was a 30 year look at disasters. And they have this, figure two might lead one to believe that disasters occur more frequently today than in the beginning of the century. However, reaching such a conclusion based only on this graph would be incorrect. In fact, what the figure is really showing is the evolution of the registration of natural disaster events over time. And they go on to say that over the past 30 years, again, since 2004, development in telecommunications, media, uh, increased international cooperation has played a critical role in the number of disasters reported at the international level. In addition, increases in humanitarian funds have encouraged reporting of more disasters, especially smaller events that were previously managed locally. Deborati Guha Sapir um, from CRED, who ha has led the, uh, the EMDAT data collection, um, has expressed some frustration. So last year she was interviewed by a Swedish journalist um, and she said, even today we have people quoting us saying, the EMDAT database shows that disasters are increasing in an alarming way. It's not increasing in an alarming way. I think that's wishful thinking. We've said at our press conference that there's not been an increase. 
Nobody wants good news. Here's their database. If we take uh, 2000 to 2021, so I start the beginning of this century because that's when they say they have good confidence that they have good global coverage um, and go to 2021, uh, what we see, again, it looks like a slight decline, but the strongest thing you can say about this data set is that it's not increasing. Um, disasters are not increasing globally, certainly not by a factor of five over the last 50 years. Again, straight up misinformation. Let's talk about US disasters. So just this week, NOAA, uh, the, the agency I just praised for their work on hurricanes, I'm gonna give them a little bit of uh, criticism now for their um, pumping, I guess, promoting of the billion dollar disaster data set. Um, they collect a tabulation, just a simple count of the number of so-called disasters, um, that cause a billion dollars in damage, and they put out a little bar chart. Um, and so this week they updated it, I guess, after Hurricane Ian. <coughs> um, less than 24 hours later, um, an advocacy group called Climate Central pumped out to journalists around the country um, graphics and data on uh, billion dollar disasters. And then, voila, climate change is causing more billion dollar disasters. Um, it's, an, it's an interesting operation and it's waiting for some uh, smart investigative journalist to go on and see what's going on here. But let's just talk about the science here. Um, I've written a lot about the billion dollar disaster and I've done a lot of work on adjusting historical disaster losses for societal change. But here's what's wrong with the billion dollar disaster data set. On the left is Miami Beach in 1926. On the right, 2022. So imagine a big hurricane hits Miami Beach in 1926. How much damage is it going to cause? Not much. 2022, a lot. In fact, there was a big hurricane that hit Miami in 1926. Um, and we estimate, based on our research, that were it to occur today, it would approach $300 billion. Um, and the reason for that, and it could be an identical hurricane, 1926, which caused something like uh, $300,000 in damage, 1926 dollars, um, is more people, more property, more wealth. Yes, of course, billion dollar disasters are going to increase because we have a, a lot more stuff to be damaged. Um, straight up misinformation. So FEMA does something much more scientific, much more grounded in evidence and data that you probably never have heard of. It's called the National Risk Index. They take exposure, which is the value of buildings, population, agriculture exposed, um, the frequency and the loss ratio, and they come up with an expected annual loss. So for last year, if you take FEMA's National Risk Index, um, the expected loss from disasters last year was $141 billion, or about 0.6% of US GDP. If we take a look historically, at losses, disaster losses as a percentage of GDP, this is from 1990 through 2019, the median loss is exactly at that 0.6% of GDP. So FEMA has done a pretty good job. Uh, but one thing that we see here, and this, this is fairly common around the world um, at all income levels, is there is a significant decline in disaster losses as a proportion of our economy. We are doing better economically with respect to disasters. Even as billion dollar disasters increase because we're more wealthy, our wealth and our ability to cope has increased much faster. You will never see this graph in the mainstream media. But again, don't take it from me, take it from NOAA. Um, NOAA published a paper in 2013, partly motivated by my criticism of their methods. Um, and they did a nice peer reviewed paper. Um, and what they concluded was, it is difficult to attribute any part of the trends in losses to climate variation or change, especially in the case of billion dollar disasters. Shortly after this, this quote appeared on their website, um, their billion dollar disaster website and warned people not to use it to associate disasters with climate change. That quote no longer appears. Right, this one is the big one. This is the, the, the elephant in the room, climate scenarios. This is a big problem. So we use scenarios um, to envision different futures. 
Um, and this is a very useful graph. Um, and you'll, I'll show a few graphs that have kind of a cone shape to them. Uh, if we start today, now, there's not too many possible futures tomorrow and next week. But if we go 100 years into the future, there's a lot of possible futures. Um, some are plausible. They could happen. Um, there's business as usual, kind of where we're headed. Um, there's probable futures. What's futures that are more likely than others? It's, it's, it's probable I'm going to wake up in Oslo tomorrow and not Boulder. And then there's another category called preferable futures. Uh, we want to try to direct our, our route into the future in certain directions. Climate uh, science has well used scenarios um, really for the last 50 years um, because prediction of long term futures, um, not just the climate future, but the societal future or energy future or, or uh, economic futures, that's, re that's a really difficult business. So, scenario planning is very useful um, and there's really no alternative. So, let me get a little technical on that. So, about almost 20 years ago now, um, the, the scenario community that works with the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, um, started putting together new scenarios to guide climate research. Um, the IPCC in its fifth assessment report ultimately collected almost 1,200 of those scenarios. Obviously, 1,200 scenarios is too many to, <laughs> to use in research. Um, and so what the uh, IPCC did was, uh, and I should say the IPCC community did, was select four of these 1,200 scenarios. Uh, we have done some work in recent years, and we've asked a question that um, really hasn't been asked. Um, now that we're in 2022, which of these scenarios remain plausible? Um, because as you go into the future, um, some futures become less likely and some become more likely because we move in certain directions. Um, and I'm happy to share these papers. We'll talk about it in the, in the, in the Q&A. Um, long story short, we found that some of these upper end scenarios are simply implausible. Um, these upper end, as you can see here um, on the vertical axis, this is emissions from fossil fuels. These high end scenarios envision a future where the world goes entirely to coal fired energy. We get rid of wind, we get rid of solar, get rid of, get rid of nuclear, get rid of natural gas, get rid of oil and petroleum. Um, we believe, and a lot of this um, was led by my colleague, Justin Ritchie, University of British Columbia, um, who, who really was the first one to crack this open um, almost a decade ago. Uh, the high-end scenarios are no longer particularly plausible. Um, what are more plausible are some of these lower end scenarios, um, such as what's called RCP 4.5. Uh, the scenario that we're headed toward um, doesn't even appear here. Um, I'll talk a bit about that in a second. Um, and now, if you want to guess what scenario has been the most used in climate research and assessment, think about it. It's this one. It's the upper end scenario the top of the implausible range. Now, you might say, well, you know, Roger, your work, maybe it's an outlier, maybe you're, you're giving us some, some nonsense. This is a nice figure put together by Zeke Hausfather of recent studies from 2019 to 2022, um, showing different projections for where um, current policies are leading us. Um, so you can see different temperatures for 2100 here. And here's our study. Um, right here between two and three degrees. And what you see here is that most of these studies are, fall between two and three degrees. Some are below um, and some are above, um, but it looks like at this point um, on current policies, where the world is today, um, we're not headed to meet the Paris goals, but we're certainly not headed to four or five degrees Celsius by 2100. Um, so there's a, an emerging broad consensus in the literature. Now, why does the climate community focus on the most extreme scenarios? It's a long story. If you're interested, Justin Ritchie and I wrote a 21,000 word paper that goes into the, the, the innards and the history and the details. Long story short, the climate modeling community, that's what the CMIP-6 refers to, um, prioritized, so this is the, high prior, this is a, the highest priority, the tier one, um, the high forcing, um, 
And the low forcing, this is the scenario that didn't appear in the IPCC, where we're headed for is, is uh, low forcing, low priority. So the implausible scenarios or what turned out to be implausible scenarios um, were prioritized and the plausible reference scenario was pretty much ignored. Now, to be fair and to give credit to the climate modeling community, there's reasons why you would want in climate research to use a high emission scenario because then you can better separate out the, the signal of forced climate change from the noise of natural variability. Um, in, in scenario planning, we call those exploratory studies. Let's just see what happens. Um, it's not a prediction. Um, it's not the most likely scenario. It may not even be um, a plausible scenario. That's fine. Um, but what happened is that somewhere along the way, like a game of telephone, the high forcing scenarios became characterized as where we're headed, the most likely future. And no surprise, because the climate modeling community emphasizes these high-end scenarios, they are also the most commonly mentioned in the IPCC reports. 41% um, plus refer to this SSP5 8.5 or RCP 8.5. Now, even as research has moved in the direction of suggesting that high-end scenarios are less plausible, their role in the IPCC reports has increased. So this shows for working group one, which is the physical science in red here, um, an increase from 30 to 40% of the scenario mentions. Working group two, which is the impacts, um, you know, went from about 45% to 60% of the mentions. Um, there's an overwhelming focus on extreme implausible scenarios. So what does this mean? Uh, oh, one before I get into what it means, um, and this is an accurate reflex, reflection of the academic literature. Um, most commonly used scenario in climate research over the last decade or so is the highest warming scenario. So what does this mean? So if you read something in the newspaper, and I, and I have for the last three or four years played a game on Twitter where there's a newspaper article and I'll mentions climate change is gonna do this out of the other thing in a hundred years. And I go to the underlying academic paper and I look up what scenario it uses. Um, I'd be willing to take good money <laughs> with anyone that the odds are it's RCP 8.5. Um, and indeed, and this is just something I put together um, actually a couple of years ago now in one week's worth of news stories, all RCP 8.5 studies. In fact, I just looked this up for this talk in 2022, RCP 8.5 remains the high-end scenario, the most used scenario in, in research. About 20 studies are published using RCP 8.5 every single day, every day. They have big impacts, scary impacts. They're very popular with university press offices. Reporters love them, uh, but they refer to futures that are currently implausible. They are far up the, uh, off the scale of where present policies are taking us. Um, they paint a picture which is much more dire um, than the picture would be painted if we were using more uh, plausible scenarios. Now, this scenario uses, it's not just an academic question, it's not just a media question, it's not just a politics question. Um, the scenarios, climate scenarios are used in um, ESG investment and finance, um, central bank stress testing. And um, so this is the network for greening the financial system. They use a different set of scenarios and that's a different talk. But again, the focus is on plausible futures. Um, and once we start talking about the global financial system, we're talking about real real world policy. So the scenarios used by the NGFS, um, you can see um, their, their uh, central scenario has has gone down um, in terms of the total emissions quite a bit from 2020, 2021, 2022. That's good news. They're realizing that they were way off the deep end and implausible. Um, however, if we compare where they're at in their current version with let's say a net zero target for 2100, the world has committed to 2050, but if they don't get there, maybe 2100, um, still way off on the implausible end. Um, so they've been moving towards plausibility that they could do more. Um, scenarios are um, hidden, they're highly technical, they're impenetrable, 
and they are an incredibly important factor in how we think about um, climate policy and actually take action. So I'm gonna wrap up now. So what do we do now in the scientific community? And I focus on the scientific community because um, I'm a member of the scientific community. I think we can take care of our own house. Um, if I knew how to get politicians to do anything, I'd probably be making more money and in a different field. Um, I don't know how to get journalists to do anything. So here's what we can do in the scientific community. First, we can admit there's a, a misinformation problem. Um, it's not just climate deniers. Um, there's a misinformation problem uh, on the side of uh, those calling for action. Um, in the scientific community, we need to do better at upholding and rewarding scientific integrity. Um, there are strong social norms against doing what I'm doing right now. Um, there's professional punishments, there's ostracism. Um, there's a lot of pathological politics inside climate science. And again, I say this as someone who's committed to climate action. There's, there's real and there's good science there, um, but that doesn't mean that anything goes. Um, we have to be aware of and root out what's called noble cause corruption. Um, and that's the idea that, well, if you're pursuing a good cause, you don't have to uphold scientific integrity. It's okay, anything goes. Um, that's, that's a route towards losing trust among the public and policymakers. And um, we should always hold ourselves to high standards. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. And that means sometimes we call out things that are uncomfortable. Um, we have to hold the IPCC to high standards. As, as you may have gathered, um, I'm a fan of the IPCC. I think that um, if, it, if it didn't exist, we'd have to invent it. Is it perfect? By no means, it's not perfect. Um, and it can do better, but it's, it's a very important institution, uh, assessment, assessment in general. Um, and we have to recognize that trust is harmed by um, performing or evaluating research judged by whose side it may or may not favor. Um, if I had a dollar for every time someone told me that what I'm saying is not helping their favorite cause, um, I could probably fund a couple of research programs. Um, my job as a, an academic is not to produce research designed to support a cause. Um, if there are no increase in hurricanes in the United States since 1900, then there's no, there's no increase. You know, deal with it, that's the, that's the facts. And again, I'm gonna emphasize scenarios are, are one of the most important factors and um, pervasive in climate research and the climate research community urgently needs to update scenarios. And I would argue to rethink the proper use of scenarios in climate research. Um, here's how you can find me. Um, I run a, a newsletter on Substack, um, please sign up, it's free. Happy to have you uh, engage in discussions, raise difficult questions on this and, and many other topics outside of climate science. Um, and I look forward to our conversation. So over to you, Scott. Thanks a lot, Roger. That was really interesting. Uh, <clears throat> before we uh, uh, go on to the Q&A, uh, we, we have a number of uh, questions that have come into the chat. Thank you for those. Uh, we're going to try to get to them, but uh, we prefer, if you can, to please post them in the Q&A uh, because that uh, provides us a bit more flexibility and and uh, uh, ability to respond uh, creatively and positively to your, your questions. Questions coming in are looking uh, quite fantastic, and thank you all for putting them in uh, for us. Um, I did want to um, uh, explore before we get to the Q and A, uh, an interesting, well, something that was interesting to me in your presentation, and this is the tendency of of, uh, of people to go towards the most extreme uh, and implausible scenarios for for what's coming. And and you posted uh, several headlines uh, from different uh, uh, newspapers. Okay, uh, you can excuse journalists for that, you know, because this is really just a version of if it bleeds, it leads uh, kind of thing. It's the kind of thing that sells newspapers, but it doesn't really tell us why so many scientists are going for the most extreme and implausible scenarios. Why do you think that is? So uh, Justin Ritchie and I in our paper, um, we talk about this at, at some length and, and our argument is it's, it's not a simple answer. It's not that scientists are politically motivated. Um, it's not simply that. Um, there are good reasons for scientists to use extreme scenarios in research. Um, but the incentives that we have in the media, in um, <laughs> online media, on Twitter and elsewhere, um, as you say, the more extreme claims, um, 
tend to get more attention. Um, and that reinforces um, some of the dynamics of academia, because if your work is in the New York Times or the Washington Post or The Economist, um, your university will send it around to administrators. Um, people who, who, who judge grants and write grants will say, oh, I remember, I saw that study in the, in the newspaper. Um, we tend to reward research that's popular, not necessarily research that's solid or good or important, um, but boring. Um, so I do think um, there are an interlocking set of incentives that have pushed this. Um, I think the, the question that I ask is what does it take to self-correct? Um, I mean, there's plenty of areas of science. You know, one I often cite is um, in cancer research. Um, there's a cell lines that have been, you know, a skin cancer cell line has been confused with the breast cancer line. And that has gone on to infect, you know, hundreds, thousands of publications. Um, and getting that corrected has been a really hard thing to do. So it's not unique to climate science. Sometimes science gets off track and self-correction takes a while. Um, if it were as simple as just politics, um, which it's not, it would be a lot easier to fix. It's, it's just a, 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 a systemic failure. Yeah, and uh, some uh, uh, speculators or, or analysts of science policy have pointed out that that this, this tendency to follow hers rather than to be properly skeptical scientists, which is to me the real social value that scientists can bring to this. They can bring a, a sort of a cold, uh, cold-eyed uh, skepticism to the claims that are being made by politicians. But then, on the other hand, you know who's 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 uh, who's funding, you know, directing funding streams to one particular area or another. And of course, one of the problems is there's a great deal. There is a great deal of money involved in rewarding uh, the kind of uh, uh, herd following that uh, we see so so strongly in climate science and as you say, uh, among other uh, things as well. I mean, we see it very strongly in evolutionary biology, which is my field. And, and uh, uh, so um, this raises the question, you know, are we really, making the right funding decisions for this or is it uh, is there something there that uh, that where political imperatives are actually driving a field of science much further than it should just because there is so much money flowing through uh, through that 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 particular viewpoint yeah i think in um there's been an interesting evolution in, in the field of climate is that there is now a large number of um, consulting groups, um, for lack of a better term, that offer what's called climate analytics. And they're telling companies, you know, we can tell you the risk you're gonna have on January 30th, 2047 from floods um, in your zip code. Um, and they're using RCP 8.5 and RCP 4.5. Um, and there actually is, um, you know, I don't think that in, in academia and climate, even in climate science, unless you're building satellites, you know, it's not huge money there. Um, but when you involve central banks um, and um, you know, the, the billionaires around the world, um, then we're talking real money moving around. Um, and so I do think that there are some incentives that again, contribute to the lock-in. Um, who wants to be the person that spoils the party? Like me, you know, hey, you, you should be looking at 3.4 watts per meter squared scenario is not 8.5 um, yeah. that's yeah. that's not that's not too exciting yeah 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 well you know i can say that i've been there as well you know in an area where there's not nearly as much money flowing uh you know evolutionary biology but uh, of course there is uh you still have the same kind of uh structure of rewards and uh, incentives uh that operate now that were really very different from the time when we scientists were supposed to be properly skeptical. You know, the the uh, stakes for being a follower of the crowd are much, much higher now, primarily because there's so much money being involved in this. And those are ultimately political decisions, which, of course, ultimately politicizes science. And uh, this comes back to your question of how do you self-correct when, when you have all the incentives pushing everyone in one direction? I mean, there's no incentive to self-correct. Yeah, I hear from a lot of people, and it's it's actually an increasing number that people, you know, I'll give talks like this, and you know, I give a lot of talks around the world. People will say, you know, I, I, you know, I agree with what you said about you know hurricanes or scenarios, 
but I can't say this in public. Mm-hmm. And, you know, quite aside from politics and money, um, there are social pressures in our communities. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, part of it might be you're worried that you might be um, identified or called names or, or whatever, or you might be seen to be, you know, with the bad guys. So I think, again, I think it's really complex. I think it's an emergent system that has a lot of interlocking factors. Um, yeah, maybe money's a factor, maybe politics are a factor, but there's social norms, there's career pressures, there's university pressures, there's you know, publication pressures, and all of those uh, in, inter- interact with each other. Yeah, and of course, when you have tenure, as you mentioned, uh, you can uh, stick your neck out a little bit more than the up-and-coming young scientists, and uh, they're the ones that are facing the career pressures and uh, disincentives most strongly, I think. And so, how do we how do we embolden them? How do we protect uh, young uh, scholars who don't have tenure to be able to speak up in a properly skeptical tone, as you do? Yeah, so I mean, this is one, and this, I mean, the only, I wish I had, a, you know, a good answer to these issues, but the, yeah, the one too. that I, I keep coming back to is, uh, is leadership within the scientific community. Yeah. Uh, we need people at um, national academies, federal agencies, uh, professional associations who are willing to make space for people to um, disagree, to debate, to hold views that may be politically unpopular on the left or the right. Um, too often, I think the last 20 years, we've seen leaders in the political community um, who, who maybe wish they were advocates or working for an NGO or a member of Congress and pushing the cause. Um, and that just becomes more chilling for, um, for, for young academics. So again, we need uh, leadership that, that says, you know, hey, it's okay. Um, you, you know, any one of us can be wrong on any topic, but it's okay mm-hmm. to air the ideas because that's how all the ideas get stronger. Yeah. Do you see that leadership coming from the from the scientific community? Do you see that coming? Um, I'm optimistic, but um, I haven't seen a, a particular groundswell of support. I mean, I guess you know another area I work in is the pandemic, and it's really interesting to see um, with respect to generally with respect to pandemic modeling, um, not the origins debate, but pandemic modeling and how to deal with the pandemic. Um, In different places around the world, there's a recognition that more diversity of expertise um, would have been beneficial in in responding to the pandemic. Um, It's quite different than the climate area. Um, So I do think these issues are very contextual and the the local politics, let's say, of of climate versus the pandemic or other issues um, really dictates (laughs) whether it's it's a the field is healthy or not. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's a uh, it's it's a topic. I think we could go on uh, for another uh, half an hour at least, uh, if not more. But I see we've got the questions and answers, and also uh, uh, questions in the uh, in the uh, uh, chat. Uh, the last one being when will Scott de- get the questions? So I think that's our prompt to <laughs> to go to the to go to the Q and A. And that was Dick Matheson. Thank you very much for that. So I really was working up to that. Uh, but let's go to the uh, let's go to the uh, to the questions and answers. And uh, by the way, there have been several um, several uh, questions that have come into the chat. We'll try to get to those as best we can. But uh, let's start up here with Terry Foreman, who very shortly after we started uh, asked your view of the Columbia School of Journalism's Trusted Narrative Initiative. I, he wonders if this is the correct name. They send out the climate narrative for all journalists to push in the uh, MSN. Uh, what do you know about this Trusted Narrative? initiative is yeah, that a factor yeah. in you know, is that a factor in the press emphasizing these these uh, these uh, high risk and plausible scenarios yeah there has been a rise um, in in I guess the last decade let's say of, of fact checking and you know stamps of approval and you know, Pinocchios that are put on claims um, and um, for simplistic things, um, you know, that's fine that th- those things work, uh, like we're going to evaluate what, what Joe Biden or Donald Trump said in the State of the Union address. Um, but w- and when it comes to things like my research or your research or someone who's, who's a, a global expert in a particular topic, the idea that there's, you know, a journalist is going to come and decide whether you know, your narrative is correct or your facts are correct, um, to me, it gets things a, a bit backwards. Um, 
And there's been a lot of discuss. I teach this in my classes about challenges with, with the idea of fact checking and coming up with a single truth. Um, I prefer very much um, that we rely on robust assessment processes um, like the IPCC or the equivalent um, where experts come together and hash it out. Um, every time I see a newspaper article about hurricanes that does not reference the IPCC, I know that you have a reporter that's freelancing and you know picking cherry picking the experts they want and the narrative they want. So no, I'm not a big fan of journalism um, putting stamps of approval on experts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, of course, you know the ideal role of journalism as well as scientists is to uh, empower people to make up their own minds on on yeah. something, give them the information, and equip them to be able to do this. Um, Okay, so let's continue. Uh, old guy, whoever you are, um, he asked what percentage of climate change is natural versus anthropogenic as a result of mankind's use of fossil fuels. Is there misinformation about this question? Um, that seems to be getting a bit away from what you have been uh, uh, saying, which is you look at the data and then you look at what politicians are telling us and you find that there's often a real disconnect there. But uh, can you comment on you know what's natural and what's anthropogenic? Yeah, I mean, and I, I, I'd uh, refer the old guy, you know, to the IPCC, and not everyone agrees uh, 100% with what the IPCC mm -hmm. says on that working group one, um, but that's mm -hmm. fine. Um, and, you know, I'll rely on something that I learned from my, my father. Carbon dioxide from the emission of fossil fuels is a first order climate forcing. Yeah. So, uh -huh. you know, people can quibble over what percent it is, um, but yeah. the reality is until our emissions go to zero, it's going to remain a first order climate forcing. So yeah. it's the sort of thing where decimal point accuracy is less important than knowing the big picture. Um, and that's why I've long supported going to net zero carbon dioxide. Mm -hmm. it's yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, here's Terry Foreman. He asked a question that actually is is uh, uh, close to home here where I am. Um, uh, he, he says that, uh, uh, what's your view on mitigation versus adaptation? And let me put that into context. I'm, I'm sitting here in the country of Namibia right now, and Namibia has adopted a very aggressive climate policy. Uh, they're looking to get to net zero by 2050, along with uh, many of uh, uh, the other countries uh, that are there. And the curious thing about that is that Namibia accounts for 0.003% of global carbon emissions. And nothing that they do will have any impact on the global carbon budget. Yet there's a, a huge amount of money coming <laughs> in to this country uh, from uh, the Green Climate Fund, other kinds of governmental uh, organization funding of various kinds of projects here, approved projects, meaning, of course, solar and wind, uh, not nuclear, curiously enough, but 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 nothing on development of uh, fossil, they're, they're already uh, significant fossil fuel reserves. And, uh, you know, when you're talking about a developing country, um, uh, then, of course, uh, in order to, to develop, you need energy to be able to pull that off. And, and uh, the, the justification for spending all this money in Namibia is for mitigation of supposed uh, climate disasters that are that are coming up and there's a whole you know basket of things that people put into mitigation like uh, uh, contour plowing uh, don't throw your food away uh, uh, you know these these kinds of things and and so this is a kind of a distortion of the political economy of a country that that uh, uh, actually is kind of holding it back from what it should be doing for for economic development in its countries. Now, uh, and this I think is a common scenario in uh, a lot of developing countries that actually don't contribute very much to uh, the global carbon budget, uh, uh, yet there's money to be able to fund this kind of uh, thing, usually actually going on with the very implausible scenarios that you mentioned. And that's an example, I think, of, of how political money can really distort uh, a um, the, the development plan of a development country and in ways that I think people in the North and West don't really uh, uh, appreciate. But that was my long-winded uh, introduction to this question. Uh, uh, so uh, seems like mitigation in short term is futile and risky, probably wasted investment to a large extent in terms of bang for your buck. And here he's he's channeling Bjorn uh, Lomborg. And uh, 
adaptation seems a no risk approach and better insurance. Um, so mitigation versus adaptation. Uh, 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 mitigation is probably driven by the very implausible scenarios you're talking about. But what about adaptation? Do you see do you see uh, advocates for uh, adaptation also being driven by these very implausible scenarios? Yeah, so I've, I've written a lot and for a long time about it, uh, mitigation and adaptation. And, and one thing is I use the, the, the word in the middle, not versus, but and. Um, and. And as you say, well, I mean, adaptation is necessary, not just to climate change, but to climate. Uh, many places around the world are poorly adapted to the existing climate where people um, and species actually live. So, um, so adaptation is a necessity. And it just turns out that if we become more robust to climate, we become more robust to climate change. Um, adaptation is really important. Uh, mitigation is also important. Um, and as you say, there are parts of the world where um, there's you know, two to three billion people um, who lack access to modern energy services. Um, and if uh, you or I or anyone listening to this um, didn't have electricity, um, we would want electricity and we would want it whether it was powered by coal or nuclear or wind or whatever, because living a life without electricity is pretty hard. So, so mitigation has to proceed um, in a way that allows energy access to expand, uh, but also um, for societies to keep the lights on. Um, there are, there, and this is something that gets underplayed. There are good reasons to mitigate. So to get off of fossil fuels, let's say, that are completely independent of climate. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm sitting in, in Europe right now and uh, the, the, the war in Ukraine um, exposed uh, the vulnerabilities of relying on a, uh, you know, dictatorial petro state. Um, so it's, it's, um, it's good policy. And we also want energy to be cleaner, not just carbon dioxide, but particulate pollution from burning things. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of good interlocking reasons, but, you know, the, the, the what will um, measure progress with respect to mitigation is going to be the cost and de deployment capabilities of energy technologies. Um, if we had a little box that would produce, you know, vast amounts of energy for free with no pollution, all right, problem solved. Um, but, but it's not that easy. Not so, so yes, we have to adapt and we have to mitigate. They're not trade-offs. They and as the um, as Terry Corbin says here, they proceed on different time scales. Uh, but we're smart enough to walk and chew gum. Yeah, I mean, we've been adapting to climate for centuries, really, you know, and it's, uh, and so, you know, it's, uh, it's uh, I'm, I'm not sure a, a big uh, restructuring of our economy is necessary to be able to prompt people to adapt because they do do it uh, normally. Uh, William Fletcher has a kind of interesting, uh, interesting question here. Uh, he cites two recent uh, uh, papers. Uh, it puts uh, ECS at a fraction of a degree, strong evidence, presents, presents strong historic evidence of warmer Roman and medieval periods. What do you think of this evidence and why are you so confident that the current climate situation is serious? Yeah, I'm going to pass on that one. Uh, You're going to pass. Okay. okay. All right. Okay. All right. Uh, and uh, he's, uh, right, uh, this thing seemed to be updating here. It's jumping around. Um, here we are. Barry uh, asks, in discussing climate scenarios, you use the term current policies. What exactly are those policies? And do they assume achievement of net zero by 2035? Yeah, thanks, Barry. Good question. Simple answer. Mm -hmm. Current policies um, are generally, and there are a number of different groups around the world that, that do this is they take policies that are on the books today, not promises, policies. So net zero by 2035 is not uh, is a promise, it's not a policy. And they simply extend those policies out into the future with no changes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, they do have um, targets and they use those to come up with another set of scenarios. But current policies is basically think it, think of it as freezing today's policies and then seeing how that future evolves. Yes, yes. Okay. So it just projects <laughs> that into the future then the uh, consequences. So, and uh, uh, so that was Barry and uh, 
Uh, you'll like uh, uh, Ivan Avin, uh, great speech, Roger. Um, and that's nice. And But he, he's asking a question that we addressed a little while ago. What could be the main drivers behind statements like Deborati's nobody wants good news? And we already mentioned one, uh, you know, newspapers like uh, if it bleeds, it leads, especially on climate. Uh, but uh, there are also some other things. So so do you have any insight into uh, into what went into Deborati's statement that nobody wants good news? I mean, she, she was obviously very frustrated by the fact that uh, people weren't paying attention to um, the relatively optimistic uh, statement that she made, but what else is going on there? Yeah, exactly. I can't speak for Debbie. Um, yeah. And, you know, I share her frustrations. Um, yeah. and, and, you know, we live in a time where, like you say, if it leads, it leads. Um, but on climate, um, and this is not new. I mean, this goes back to, um, you know, better part of a century that, that apocalyptic stories of end of times, whether it's because of the global population you know, in the 1960s and 1970s, uh, nuclear Armageddon in the 1980s, um, and then more recently climate change, does have a cultural fix, uh, particularly in the West, on how we think. Um, I'll be writing about this at the Honest Broker shortly, um, and it's, it's distinct from um, the more religious types of um, millenarianism and the end of times. Um, but there is this idea that we humans are going to destroy the world and we deserve it because we're causing it and only we can save it. Um, so there is this idea that you know, bad news um, somehow is comforting to people. The idea, well, we can, we can use that to reshape the world. We can start anew. Um, um, and, you know, in my own work, um, you know, explaining to people that once you adjust for more people and more population, uh, hurricane damage hasn't gone up. And that's not that, that's not an exciting story. You're not going to have a headline on that. So I, I mm. get kind of the media dynamics, but I do think there's a much mm. deeper underlying cultural sentiment um, behind that. Yeah, this millenarianism that you uh, mentioned, you know, the, the main difference between a religious uh, type and a climate type is that uh, uh, climate type is a very humanist uh, kind of an approach to it, but still motivated by this sort of uh, original sin idea and redemption that uh, motivates uh, uh, more God-based uh, religious things, which, of course, puts the power outside of you rather than and then uh, puts it in you, which is what the climate system is doing. Um, here's a question from Terry Foreman, uh, relevant to what we were discussing earlier. Uh, what can we do as individuals to combat misinformation besides refer people to your Substack and website? And so I think this ties into the question that we addressed earlier about uh, uh, leadership in the sciences and helping to uh, to defend scientific integ integrity. Uh, you know, the leadership to actually do that rather than to simply chase uh, chase the money that's there in climate science. So what yeah. can individuals do? Yeah, it's a really, really good, good question. Mm -hmm. It's really hard because it's difficult. Um, I mean, I mean, you and I, and probably many people who are listening, um, who might have PhDs, we're experts in one little thing. Yeah. that's like this narrow and really deep. Yeah. And on yeah, everything minus, else in the world, we don't know. Yeah, and minus so, termites. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So in 2022, <laughs> you know, being able to secure good, solid information. Um, is really tough. And it's a lot easier to tell people what not to do. Don't go out surfing on the internet looking for the paper or the expert that confirms what you want to hear. Yeah. Um, yeah. A lot of times, um, you know, again, assessments are important because they force experts to come together and to, to put a line in the sand where they where they stay. Look for assessments on issues, not, not fact checkers in your favorite newspaper or TV show, um, and then read them and become familiar. Um, and you know there are some things for which we have pretty robust knowledge and other things there's a lot of uncertainty. Um, and in a lot of policy realms where I work, um, smart policy fortunately doesn't depend on everybody agreeing on the underlying science. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, what makes yeah. sense on mitigation and adaptation of climate change, um, I think I can make an argument to you know, the left and the right without having everybody agree on you know, exact details of equilibrium climate sensitivity or, or anything like that. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, getting getting back to this 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 issue of, of 
of integrity in the sciences. Uh, David Gall Galligan, yes, Galligan in the uh, in the chat has a has uh, I think a relevant question. So he asks in the scientific community we have a cancel culture which where only certain narratives are allowed and it's devastating to the pursuit of knowledge. And I do agree with that, uh, but it doesn't extend just to climate. You know, I I. I I, for example, not to talk about myself, but within two days, I've been subject to two different uh, uh, Twitter storms, uh, one about my views on evolution and then one for hosting this and having you as a guest on on uh, on on our on our webinar. And so this kind of censorious culture seems to actually have percolated quite deeply in the sciences. And, uh, uh, you know, I, all I can say is one hopes for some leadership somewhere to reverse this, because because I do agree with David Galligan that this is very destructive to uh, to the integrity of science, you know, it's a, uh, and uh, you and I both agree that that's really what we should be uh, aiming towards. Um, that was just yeah, a comment I, I, on my part. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, you know, I have a, a slightly different view. I mean, one of the things mm -hmm. I've learned, um, which I think is, is, you know, for me, it's empowering. Um, mm -hmm. I can't be canceled. Um, you know, I, I, I was, I got hired in a high profile job working for Nate Silver almost a decade ago, um, mm. writing on environmental issues and he was going to let me write on sports. And there was a campaign, a public mm -hmm. campaign, a Twitter storm. Um, and I got fired from that job because um, he couldn't take the heat. Um, and for me at the moment, I thought, oh boy, I've been, you know, this was before people use the word canceled, but you know, I've been canceled, I've been eliminated. Um, but it turns out in 2022, I have far more, I have tens of thousands of people reading my substacks every week. Um, and, you know, one of the strengths of academic tenure is that you can't be fired for your views. Uh, people can make your life difficult. They can put pressure on you. They cannot send you Christmas cards, not invite you to parties. You might not get your grants funded. Um, but you know, guess what? If if that's the price to pay for having broad impact and voice, it seems to me that's pretty fair. So so I think that um, I mean this is part of the problem is that we teach young scientists now to become science communicators, go out in the world, and then people are shocked when there's pushback, there's angry people, there's mobs, there's outrage, there's ignorant people. There's you know take your pick. Um, guess what? It's a privilege to be an academic and a scientist that has something important to say about important topics. So, you know, I, I tell, you know, my colleagues that if you, it's, it's the old saying, if you can't take the hit, heat, get out of the kitchen. Um, and if you wanna be in the kitchen, that's a choice and, you know, you gotta have the personality for it, um, but you can find it rewarding. But don't expect, no one should expect that you're gonna go out and engage on a controversial topic and people are gonna pat you on the back and give you high fives. Um, the definition of a controversial topic is about half the people are going to be pissed off when you, when you go out and say anything. So, yeah, um, yeah I had so, a friend I mean, we, who, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. No, go I was ahead. gonna say we have, we, we are yeah. enormously privileged in our ability to have these conversations. Um, yeah. and I just think, you know, we have to do a better job teaching our, our young scientists, you know, about what to expect when, when they actually have success in that world. Yeah, I, I had a friend who told me if I wasn't making enemies, I wasn't doing my job. You know, and <laughs> and I, I I think that's true. But uh, uh, certainly, tenure does provide the protection that you are talking about, and there should be no expectation from anyone that people will agree with you, or even like you. But uh, the 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 concern that I have is that it, tenure seems to be eroding, and it tends to be being given. Uh, not so much on the basis of your willingness to take intellectual risks and uh, and uh, you know uh, stake a, stoke up a few flames in here here and there, but uh, you know in terms of someone that, that 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 we know quite well here at the National Association of Scholars, Amy Wax, you know she's uh, she's looking at a very difficult uh, uh, fight with a university that is actually determined to strip her of tenure and and uh, and you know some. Some uh, scenarios <laughs> that uh, you know even ten years ago would have been unthinkable uh, in terms of administration's treatment of of, uh, of of controversial academics, and we are kind of getting back 
well, I don't want to say we're getting there, but we're kind of edging towards uh, the, uh, the the old uh, days when uh, uh, a university could actually terminate someone's tenure and get rid of them for inconvenient views. And, no, uh, I, you know, I agree with that 100%. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I, yeah. I think that the, the issues of so-called cancel culture are one thing, but the yeah. erosion of support for tenure, whether it's state legislatures and public universities yeah. or weak, uh, I would say, uh, administrators, um, yeah. is, is extremely troubling um, because tenure is what allows me to do what I do um, and other yeah. academics. Mm. And I think the threats, um, the political threats to tenure, and some of it's, you know, some of it's driven by politics, sure. And some of it's driven by the budget model of higher education today, where it's yeah. just a lot easier to have, you know, instructors um, and temporary workers and postdocs who don't get paid much, don't have health insurance. Um, than it is to have, you know, someone who spends a career developing expertise. Yeah. That's far more troubling. Yeah, yeah. Um, you may or may not want to uh, engage Dick Matheson's, excuse me, question. Uh, uh, how do major media rate in terms of accuracy? New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, CNN, Fox, et cetera. Um, you may not want to get into that because you may not want to make more enemies than you already have. But uh, do you have any thoughts? Or do you care to uh, yeah, I mean, it's, talk um, about those? Or? Yeah, I mean, I'm happy to talk about, I mean, in my yeah. areas of expertise on climate change and you know disasters and scenarios, um, there's some problems. Um, but in general, you know, I have a lot of respect for the media. I read, I mean, I'm a pretty voracious reader and I read across the political spectrum and I encourage people to do so um, mm -hmm. and triangulate a bit. Um, yeah. the, the media is just a, you know, first draft of history and sometimes it's pretty far off, but um, yeah. you know, being engaged and yeah. consuming a diversity of stuff is what I recommend to, to my students. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so we have a lot of questions coming into the chat. Um, uh, a lot of it is is discussions between members of the of the uh, audience. So yeah. let's uh, let's let's just carry on with uh, the Q and A then. Uh, so uh, this one is a very easy one. Will the recording be available to share with others for free? Absolutely yes. Uh, especially if you're signed up, uh, you'll get a link to um, to the uh, YouTube uh, video that's being recorded as we speak, and it will be uh, accessible. And of course, uh, Roger, I think you know that you're. Uh, we welcome you sharing it as well. So, so yes, it will be available. So that's an so, so, so that's an easy one. And from there, we go to Jack Summer, um, who's asking. Uh, what's the state of time series for comparative planetary thermospheres? Uh, I'm not quite sure how to approach that uh, since you're dealing with with Earth uh, climate. Um, it may be more related to energy balance, basic energy balance issues. Uh, so I'm going to ask ask him to maybe elaborate a little bit and. Uh, on what he actually means by that. Uh, uh, yes, the entire slideshow will be available. Now that's different from the recording. Of course, uh, Roger, I'm, I, 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 I don't know what you plan to do with the slideshow. I imagine that you'll probably post it on your website. Uh, yeah, like it's going to appear student. in 18 okay. minutes. 18 minutes. Well, there you are. There's the there's the answer to this uh, uh, question. Uh, end user asked this. Uh, um, uh, Jabud, who's actually a, a common uh, or frequent uh, listener to these things, asked, is scenario the same as a model? And I would say probably no. Um, uh, a scenario is ways of playing out the implications of a model, but that's just my thought. Do you have any and yeah, so in the climate that. space, a scenario is uh, a plausible representation of how the future might evolve. That's, think of it mm -hmm. like a story. Um, mm -hmm. And then scenarios get elaborated into greater details um, through um, things called integrated assessment models. So the scenarios can be the product of a model. And then what comes out of those models can be fed into other models, Earth system models, mm -hmm. um, to, to suggest how the climate I, it, it's ridiculously complex and jargon filled. Um, but when I'm talking about scenarios here, these are the inputs that go into uh, Earth system models that project. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, uh, this uh, a question from A. Marusa has come up uh, and in various other kinds of contexts, it has come up uh, as well. And I see the battery on my mouse has just died. So let me just switch to my my uh, touchpad. Uh, 
asking about this whole issue of existential threat um, of climate change. And uh, uh, there was one um, question about, can you address Antarctic versus Arctic uh, ice sheets? Have you done any work along those lines? Um, and well, I'm not sure what the question is we should ask about existential threats. I, I think that uh, that's often used, trotted out as a means of panicking people into supporting something that they otherwise wouldn't. But um, uh, from your perspective, is there any credibility at all to existential threat scares about climate change? Yeah, so I think if, if I mean, I, we've all heard the phrase existential threat, you know, Joe, President Joe Biden likes to use it. Um, if it means we're gonna cease to exist, as a species or some countries will cease to exist, um, that is, that, those outcomes are not presently found under any of the IPCC scenarios. In fact, if you take the most extreme scenario, the one I was giving a hard time, the RCP 8.5, um, that envisions a world of incredible wealth uh, <clears throat> where, where the average person worldwide lives on the equivalent of $100,000 a year in, in today's dollars, the average person. Um, it's a world that we will have an enormous ca capacity to flourish in um, even as there's massive climate change. So the IPCC does not envision species, um, human species extinction, there's a lot of impacts on the natural world, um, but as, as far as existential threat, that's not a phrase you'll find in the IPCC. Yeah. Um... The MOA, along those lines of uh, threats and uh, scenarios and whatnot, uh, sort of, uh, says, okay, so there's no increase in hurricanes and storms, but then there's other disasters that are waiting in the wings, uh, ready to take over, like uh, wildfire fires or extreme heat events. And uh, uh, I come originally from California, where the wildfires in the in the forest there were uh, trotted out as evidence of climate change when it turns out to have been more neglective uh, infrastructure by PG&E and uh, and failures to manage forests uh, uh, properly but uh, have you done any analyses or looked into evidence of uh, of increased wildfires uh, for example yeah so so um, the the quick answer for DEMOA is go to the Honest Broker and look um, on the right-hand side at the most viewed posts on um, what the IPCC tells us about extreme events. And I have a summary of what the IPCC says uh, for each of these events in terms of what's called detection, has there been a change, and attribution, which is can we link that change to climate change? Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and then there's a further step, which is projections. Long story short, so far, um, there has been a detected change in uh, heat waves, high temperatures, um, extreme rainfall, but not flooding, um, and also what's called fire weather. So the conditions that set the stage for fire events. Um, so, so go there and, and you know, that's a whole other talk and another hour's discussion, but that information is readily available. Yeah, okay. Um... Now, here's an interesting question from A. Van Oven, who was uh, who weighed in a little bit earlier, uh, but it ties into your uh, comment about noble cause correlation. Uh, I'm not sure those are the exact words you use. Noble cause uh, corruption. Yeah. Corruption, yes, all right. right. And uh, um, I do remember, who was it? Uh, Steve Schneider said that it's okay to tell lies because the issues are so important. Uh, uh, but what other kinds of noble cause lies and corruption can you point to? Yeah, what's what Steve Schneider actually said um, was, you know, we all have to make a, a choice, uh, you know, between the balance between being effective um, and being accurate. That's a power phrase. And he said, I hope we, we will decide to be both. Uh -huh. um, yeah. But noble cause corruption refers to a situation where um, you judge the worth of an argument based on the cause that it supports. So, so I might be saying something completely wrong. Oh my gosh, hurricanes have increased by a factor of five. But if you think that gives you an advantage in, you know, a political debate, you'll look past, <laughs> you'll look past the fact that it's wrong. Um, mm -hmm. Noble cause corruption is is a problem in any um, scientific or technical area that is closely connected to a political debate, mm -hmm. and, which is why scientific institutions need to have the ability to uphold scientific integrity. 
We know yeah. how to do that really well in science. Yeah. We really yeah. do. Um, and it's notable when things break down. Yeah, yeah. Mike Smith in the chat asked a question uh, that's uh, a little bit uh, um, different. Uh, he's, 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 he's talking about CO2 in the atmosphere. Even if it didn't affect climate, net zero CO2 is a must. At some point around a thousand parts per million, there are measurable impacts on human health. Building designers have known this for years. Of course, building design is in a, a really a different question from from climate change. Are, are there any scenarios that look at at a, a, a CO two concentration in the atm in the atmosphere of a thousand parts per million? I'm not I aware of any. If, but I don't I'll, know of any either. Pass, take a pass on that. One, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I would. You know, there's the there, there, there there's the obvious uh, argument that well, a higher CO two means more plant growth, and that means greening the planet, and that's something that is actually a good thing. Um, uh, now, uh, Roll Roll, I believe, asks you state that climate change is serious. Please elaborate on what you mean by serious. Thank you. Yeah, by serious, I mean mm -hmm. that the 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 risks associated with climate change are sufficient that we probably should be considering mitigation, adaptation policies in response. Mm -hmm. um, in the climate fix, I spent chapter one explaining this. Climate science gets us to the place where we say, well, we might wanna make some decisions here. That's serious. Mm -hmm. um, it's mm -hmm. something, a, a, an issue that is not serious is one that we say, well, I don't have to worry about that one. Yeah. Um, yeah. The good news, and this is often missed, is that action on energy or action on making ourselves less vulnerable to, to environmental shocks um, makes good sense irrespective of what you or I believe ultimately on climate change. Yeah, um, there are yeah. plenty of good reasons to, to get off coal, for example, right? Um, we could start there. Um, particulate air pollution around the world kills millions of people, yeah. um, undoubtedly. Yeah. And so especially in the developing reason. world, yeah, especially right. in the developing world, definitely. Yeah. So, so, yeah, by serious, I mean, we get to the point where we want that on the agenda of things that we want to have in our, our policy uh, thinking. Yeah, and uh, other people have made the point that, uh, okay, so it's a sensible thing to do, uh, go to cleaner burning fuels, uh, um, solar and wind have their place in an energy economy, but probably uh, can't bear the whole burden themselves uh, but nuclear seems to be the obvious uh, obvious solution to that and yet it's uh, anathema to a lot of the green uh, green uh, uh, elites if you will in the west uh, and and so do you have any insight into why people are so opposed to nuclear which is such an obvious solution to concern over co2 in the atmosphere what's yeah, driving that what's yeah. I teach an energy policy class, and in my class, yeah. I, I start out by telling my students that, that energy technologies are a little bit like you know NFL football teams. Um, mm -hmm. People have the ones they like, the ones they don't like, they cheer for the ones they like, and it's a big, fun sport. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. The reality is, as you suggest, that, that any global energy uh, system is going to require a mix of technologies. Um, I have a hard time doing decarbonization math without having a, a significant presence of nuclear. Um, nuclear is shown to be extremely safe um, and it's comparatively very clean. Um, some people are more afraid of nuclear than they are of climate change. That's perfectly legitimate. Um, one of the things we're seeing um, is uh, despite you know, some opposition to nuclear in Europe and North America, um, nuclear energy has a future. <laughs> and it may be in the East um, to start with, but um, I have no, no worries that nuclear energy is um, somehow going to disappear. It's, um, it's too powerful and big a technology for energy production um, to think that it's going to go away. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so we're going to be switching now to most upvotes. Uh, we've been trying to get through them uh, by the as they come in, uh, but let's let's uh, uh, take a look at a few questions that are uh, that are given the most upvotes. And of course, this is why we like to be in Q and A. So uh, here's one. Um, uh, let me just uh, get up there so I can see who it is. Uh, Oyston Shirley, uh, is the climate science community attracting and recruiting people who have strong climate doomsday beliefs? before they start their research careers. Um, 
And then the second phase is some climate scientists say that you might be right, but not helping the cause. I guess you then refer to scientific integrity. What's the next response by the researchers? The cause is more important than the science? Question mark. Yeah, so these are um, two questions that are framed in kind of uh, you know, absolute terms. Um, I've noticed among my students that I've had over the last 20 years, um, you know, 20 years ago, the, the interest in climate science was people who loved the climate, wanted to model the climate, um, and weren't so focused on um, activism or, or politics. And obviously, as the topic has grown in significance and political importance, um, there's a lot of people who have come into climate science who um, have a more activist bent. That's not necessarily a problem. A lot of those folks become frustrated when they learn that science doesn't move the world. Um, but like any high profile area, of course, there's going to be a diversity of, of motivations there. Um, yeah. yeah, and I, I do hear from people often and, and more on the activist bet, bent that, that the work that I do doesn't help the cause. I first heard that in, in 2001 um, when I was asked to brief a number of senators, members of the cabinet, um, and I've heard it since. So, um, of course, again, it's, it's kind of the, the, the landscape you'll find when science meets politics. Um, and I, I haven't, I've met very few people who argue against the importance of scientific integrity. So I think that's, yeah. uh, even in the, even in highly politicized case, uh, most scientists subscribe yeah. to the importance of integrity. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, uh, Oyston Shirley is, is, uh, has another question actually, it's got a lot of, of votes. So are there any other areas in science or research, which are analogous to the climate misinformation trend? And, uh, I've already mentioned, uh, evolutionary biology is one of them. Um, we can certainly look at COVID, which is right up your, uh, alley. Um, so I wonder if, uh, uh, perhaps your COVID work uh, could uh, fill in. Uh, yeah, well, I would point. Question. There's actually in the last, you know, last little while, last decade, a little bit less. Um, there's something called the replication crisis um, mm -hmm. in a number of areas of science, where it's discovered that that uh, research that was published and maybe was famous or um, got a lot of attention um, ultimately could not be replicated when um, this has happened in psychology, um, in economics, and other fields. Uh, and, and there's been a kind of a reckoning of, um, of misinformation or, or low quality research in a number of fields that I think has been quite healthy. It's been very contested. It's been challenged. It's been politicized. Um, I don't think climate has quite had its moment there, but I think uh, it's, not, yeah. it's not unique in the landscape of, of, of science and research. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I think we're getting towards the end of our of our uh, time here. So I'm just doing a quick scan through questions. Uh, filtering by uh, upvotes has uh, come up with a number of uh, number of questions that we've already answered. Um, uh, Seth Foreman, for example, uh, this is one we haven't answered. Uh, is there anything about increases in global CO2 emissions that concerns you? Yeah, absolutely. And that's why it's serious. <laughs> um, right. So, yeah. so, 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 yeah. yeah. I mean, that's kind of where we started with this this conversation. So, yeah. so yes, um, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And uh, someone asks uh, Eduardo Alvarez asks, uh, "What do you think of Bjorn Lomborg's approach?" You know, I've known Bjorn for twenty years. I first met him in Italy, and um, we we uh, were on a panel. Um, debating each other on these issues. Uh -huh. um, and I have a lot of respect for Bjorn. Um, he's uh, uh, been very consistent in his views. And, um, you know, sometimes he's more minimizing of climate change than I would, than I would be. Um, but on the need for adaptation, the importance of economics in structuring uh, mitigation, um, you know, I think he's, he's got a lot of smart things to say. Yeah. Okay, well, on that, I think uh, we'll wrap it up for tonight. Uh, Roger, thank you very much for being our guest tonight. Scott, thanks for having me. It was a fascinating discussion, and uh, uh, we left a number of questions unanswered. Uh, I'm sorry we couldn't get to them all, but uh, uh, Roger, let me ask if you'd be willing to field questions from uh, the people who are, are still have questions. And uh, Yeah, absolutely. Course, people can find me easily on Twitter, and you can find me at my Substack. Um, yeah. and 
feel free to participate there or one or the other place. And um, I'm always happy to take questions. I'm an open book, so. Great, okay. Thanks again, Roger, for appearing on our webinar. And uh, this uh, webinar will be up on YouTube very, very soon. And uh, 